Hey everyone, my name is Mike Vaughn. I'm a writer for Geek Fives Nation. And I'm also the author of The Ultimate Guide to Strange Cinema. And I'm Dylan Gonzalez. I'm the editorial director for GeekVibesNation.com and also a co-host of the Home Dance Film Festival podcast. And welcome to a new Video Attic New Release Roundup. Uh, if you're new here, welcome. Uh, what we do is we go back and forth and we talk about the latest home video releases. Uh, some are good, some are bad, but you know what? We always have a really fun time talking about them. And uh, with that, I am really excited to get into my first title. Um, this is my one and only Warner Archive title uh, for the week, but it's a good one. I'm I'm really pleasantly surprised with this one. It's it's the uh, three Godfall. And I should also note, this also includes the 1930s version of this film as well, um, which is uh, a really nice addition. It also has trailers for both versions of the film. This is the uh, 1948 uh, version, which is directed by John Ford. And oh my gosh, I kind of was blown away by this. I'm a big John Ford fan. Um, I'm not like an expert by any means but i've been sort of working my way through his filmography and i don't know so far i have never been really disappointed by anything he's put out and uh this is certainly no exception uh so this is kind of an interesting spin on the three wise men only you have john wayne uh in one of them <laughs> as one of the wise men which i think is fun uh basically it's these three like outlaws um they are trying to get away from this uh, sheriff, but they stumble upon a woman who has a baby and she's dying. And her last wish was to have these men take care of the baby and be their godfather. So this sort of throws a wrench in their plan to get away from the sheriff and his posse since they were like all deputized. Um, and just to up the stakes, they have a dead or alive bounty on the men the sheriff even will double the money if it's dead rather than alive. So it really ups the stakes and I don't, you know, that's all I'm going to say. I don't want to spoil it, the rest of it, but uh, yeah, being a John Ford film, I mean, the photography is amazing. Everything has this sprawling kind of epic feel to it. I really liked how John Wayne in particular is not really playing against type, but it's interesting to see him put in that sort of nurturing mode again don't get me wrong it's always it's always like very masculine coded but i think like this might be one of his better movies acting ones like i can really tell that he's invested in this uh scenario and there is some moments that is are, are quite heartbreaking um and i'll just leave it at that but um, yeah, so uh, great movie. As far as how it looks, um, again, I never have an issue with Warner Archive. Um, this movie is, I, I, um, like I said, from the 40s. Um, it looks really fantastic. Uh, as I was saying, the photography is sublime. So it's really nice to, to see a print that, quite frankly, probably looks better than it did when it was... Um, originally released i mean it's beautiful looking but it's warner archive never like does any like ai or artificial sort of touching up the film you you get that very nice film look but looking spectacular sounds gr great as well full disclosure i did not have time to see the 30s version of it this film um but i'm looking forward to it just to see like um how they are like different because i'm assuming they're also different directors but uh yeah i love this film i actually think that this was a really neat discovery it's something that i probably innately would not have like sought out myself so um yeah that's one of the fun things about this show is kind of sometimes pushing us to discover things we might not necessarily have gone after i would even say if you're not a big western fan or you're maybe wanting to sort of dip your toes in the genre this is a, a, a pretty good starter role, in my opinion awesome yeah i haven't been able to watch that one yet it sounds like it, it's an unexpected christmas movie which i always love <laughs> like if you want to <laughs> fold it into the holidays that sounds fun so i'm excited to watch that soon and then also see how the 30s one compares I'm, and i've heard 
that that one has also been given the same level of like restoration as the uh the newer version with john wayne so i yes. think it, that should be a really nice package that we have there from warner archive and but I, I always love what they do, so I, I never I never doubt them. Um, my first title um, is a new one from the Criterion Collection. It is the 4K Ultra HD release of uh, I Am Cuba, uh, which is from a Russian director, uh, Mikhail Kalitolov. Uh, I will butcher that, undoubtedly. Um, he has a couple movies in the Criterion Collection already, notably uh, The Cranes Are Flying. But I didn't really know a lot about this film before it was released. So uh, we have the 4K and Blu-ray disc here. Um, no reversible car uh, cover art, but there's some uh, background artwork here. Um, but whenever it was announced, I started uh, re researching it a little bit, and I, I saw some discourse on social media. Uh, I think it's maybe one of uh, either Phil Lord or Chris Miller uh, who did like uh, 21 Jump Street and Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. I think they had like a, they were kind of campaigning against this movie being included in the Criterion Collection because it's kind of noted as like a propaganda film. But then I also read some uh, uh, other uh, takes on it. While yes, it is, like technically a propaganda film it, there are like some artistic aspects to the and elements to it that makes it a very important film even if maybe political ideological stuff might ruffle certain people from different cultures and stuff but there's a lot of like insights uh, to that on the in the booklet that i just showed off and some of the special features that are on there but basically what this is um it's a, this was made right around the time of like the cuban missile crisis um, it, it is this Russian director telling the story about Cuba and like right uh, before kind of the revolutionary uprising of the citizens. And it's told in like four vignette forms, uh, little like just short vignettes uh, that there's like a, a narrative about like a, a young woman who is kind of have to, having to make her uh, make a life for herself as a sex worker and kind of like dealing with some of the tourism like people who come in for tourist reasons and kind of her life trying to survive in the country and then there's also one like with a farmer who gets to the land that he believes he owns sold out from under him and stuff um by the like kind of the landlord and um there's an, another couple of kind of more overtly political assassination planning on one and then another like family getting inundated with like the this kind of war-torn effort and kind of like catalyzing a young father's journey to being a revolutionary there's that's kind of like the basic four tenets of them but it's kind of showing different points and view like viewpoints from like the seeds of a, of a, a revolution and it's a really interesting film it's very visually stunning it's black and white there's a special feature on here with one of the uh, like a modern cinematographer i believe that his name's bradford young yeah he did the cinematography for um arrival uh with uh, amy adams and a lot of other great films but hearing him talk about some of the camera movement and stuff and since it was shot in black and white it there was the camera was able to kind of move a little bit more than some of the kind of the more static shots that some of the technicolor films had to uh, contend with back in the day. And you really get this sense of like uh, energy and movement. And it's really for a movie of this time, which this was made in 1964, um, it is a really alive, like a really visually alive camera and stuff. And it's a very striking movie. And whenever this was announced for 4K, I was a little bit surprised. But then once I saw it, I, I kind of understood that since it is such a visually striking movie, you kind of want the best video possible, even if it's not like the most known movie. I think they wanted to give it the best presentation possible. And it's a pretty long movie. It's like two hours and 20 minutes long. Um, but it, you never really lose kind of um, interest throughout because since these are four vignettes, if you if there's one that's kind of like starting to lose your interest, you're about to be onto another story anyway. But I, I didn't find any of the shorts or like the vignettes boring. I think they all kind of piece together very well and build to a very impactful conclusion. Um, so overall, I think it's a really uh, effective film. It's visually beautiful. Um, I am not 
politically in tune enough to get maybe all of the political messaging behind things. But uh, I'm learning more from like the special features and stuff. And um, I think if you don't view this as like a strict like recruitment film and view it as like more of a piece of like a work of art, I think it works better. And I think it's a, a more impactful film, just like viewing it um, objectively. Um, this 4K release, um, it does it, uh, it does not include high dynamic range. It's an SDR 4K release, so it, there there's no um, grand differences in like the the grayscale or anything. What we are really seeing kind of fine tuned with the 4K presentation compared to the Blu-ray presentation. Um, in addition to the fact that the Blu-ray presentation has like another hour and a half long documentary on it. So it cleans up some of the compression issues because you only have the movie on the 4K disc, more solid black levels and just like a little bit uh, richer detail. So while it may not be like a obvious night and day difference from the Blu-ray, I think it just fine tunes the movie to make it look the best that it can. Um, but the Blu-ray presentation looks nice, but what you want the Blu-ray disc for is the special features. So you have the 90-minute documentary that I was speaking of, I believe it's from 2004, which does really delve into kind of the history of this movie, its reception, and like whenever it was originally released, because it was almost kind of a lost movie. Um, it, when it was debuted in the 60s, I think it only premiered in like Russia and Cuba, and due to the subject matter, is pretty much flatly rejected. <laughs> um, and especially in Russia and it wasn't until the 90s when Martin Scorsese and Francis Ford Coppola had it put on their radars and they kind of rescued it and gave it another re-release um, so you get to hear about that in, in that special feature but there's also another 28 minute featurette with Scorsese from probably a couple of years ago like probably 20 years ago or so uh, but he is talking about how this movie came onto his radar, why he felt it needed to be kind of rescued and brought into the public consciousness and given a, a new, uh, a reevaluation um, in the public consciousness, which is how it's ended up here now. So you have that new documentary that's an hour and a half. You have the uh, Scorsese interview, which is about 28 minutes. And then you also had that previously mentioned interview with the cinematographer, um, the Bradford Young, uh, which runs about 22 minutes. Um, and then you have a trailer. Um, so other than that, that's all the special features, but what, uh, including a whole other documentary is a pretty good supplement if you're not going to go like for just sheer qu uh, quantity, the quality is very nice. So uh, I Am Cuba from the Criterion Collection is a really solid release. I had never heard of it before. It is a nice discovery. If you think it sounds a little bit interesting to you, I would give it a shot. Um, it's probably streaming on the Criterion channel. I haven't looked, but I would assume so. But um, maybe try before you buy, but if you like, it's a really good release. Nice. Um, yeah, that is also another one that I haven't heard of, but sounds interesting. <laughs> my so I have a bunch of Severn titles. Uh, my first one is Kathy's Curse, and uh, here is the back. We definitely have a lot of really nice features. Um, we have a booklet. Uh, well, before I show that off, here's the discs and. Also, they do have a, a slipcover that you can buy. You can either buy it with the slipcover or separate, um, but the slipcover has this, but the eyes actually do glow on the uh, slipcover, which is pretty cool. Um, so uh, there is just a really cool kind of um, essay about the... Um, about the film and about the, uh, a little bit about the transfer. Uh, not a lot of like pictures and stuff. Well, like just the, the one, but um, yeah, it's um, nice to have that in there. Um, sometimes they include a soundtrack, but fortunately that's not the case, but I'm really excited because um, I was actually gonna buy this on Blu-ray, but now I have the 4K. Um, so Kathy's Curse is about a possessed little girl. Um, she's possessed by the spirit of her aunt who died in a violent car crash, which um, is not the only violent car crash uh, thing that I have to talk about today. Right. Um, but um, this is certainly a play on like The Exorcist and Rosemary's Baby and Carrie. This also has a lot of bad seed and it's just really weird. 
it has this like old kind of caretaker sort of character who is sort of like Kathy's henchman, which is really fun. And he's like hilarious. And the little girl gets to completely pop off and like shout his obscenities. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I bet that actress was having so much fun just being able to swear, say the most vile things. And uh, we do get an interview with Kathy herself, which you can hear her uh, talk about that, which is really fun. Um, and yeah, again, I had seen this movie a couple of times, even with watching it multiple times, it's still one of those very incoherent films. Like the plot definitely doesn't really go from point A to B to C. It's more like A to F to E to, you know, and then we get there. But it's it's one of those so bad it's enjoyable it, it really is a lot of fun and everybody is going for a goddamn oscar and it's just beautiful uh like i said this is chock full of special features uh, we do get a really great commentary track we get a series of interviews as i said um they're really entertaining it's kind of amazing that they got everybody back together to talk about this film that right there i think is like worth the price because yeah, you can probably find us on VOD or streaming or something, but like just to get all these really cool like special features uh, looks great as well. It's not pristine, but for an older film that sort of wasn't maybe taken the best care of, it really looks nice. Maybe not the most visually stunning movie, but it really has a nice level of clarity and the colors do pop really nicely here sounds good as well also i wanted to note um this is a uh, region a b and c that way if you're like one of our non-us viewers um first of all hey um but also uh you can certainly watch this in any region which is awesome that's usually the case with 4ks but i just wanted to like let you all know that there is also a director's cut which is 91 minutes long and a US uh, release cut, which is 80, 82 minutes long. Sorry. I believe that was also the case with the Blu ray release. Um, and I don't think there's anything new out, um, outside of the booklet as far as the Blu ray release goes. I mean, but obviously the 4K. And like I said, you can get a really cool looking slipcover. I will, I'm definitely going to order one for myself to have to cover this one, but. Uh, it's a lot of fun. It's one of those movies where buy it, get a bunch of your friends together. It, it's such a fun time. Where's your mother and your brother? Mommy's gone. She's taking George with her. Your mother's a bitch. I am so insanely excited that this is uh, on 4K. And yeah, uh, I very highly recommend yeah, that sounds interesting. Uh, I There were a couple uh, from this month that you're covering Severn's announcement, uh, announcements that seemed pretty interesting to me, and that one definitely stood out. So I'm glad to hear that one is at least pretty good fun. So I, I'm definitely going to check that one out. Um, my next title, um, another boutique label. This is from uh, Shout Studios, and it is a movie I've been anticipating for a long time. I've been uh, it's been on my radar for a while, and that is Affliction uh, from Paul Schrader uh, with uh, Nick Nolte, James Coburn, uh, Sissy Spacek, and Willem Dafoe. Um, so just a very basic release. I had had this on my uh, radar previously because I'm kind of an Oscar enthusiast, so I would always just kind of look through like old winners and nominees and stuff, and I always saw this movie Affliction, and because James Coburn... Um, he won the supporting actor this year. And I was just like, what is this movie? I have no idea. And as I've grown over the years and like got more information, I learned uh, really like the de details of like Paul Schrader movies and all this stuff. And so this one was always high on my list, but it just kind of, it never was easily available. But now it's finally gotten a Blu-ray release. Um, and while it may have been a little bit overhyped in my own head based on what I could, thought uh, it could be, um, it's still a very interesting movie. Um, it is Nick Nolte. He plays kind of like a, a guy who's kind of down in his luck. He's lost his wife. He's about to lose custody of his kid. Um, 
and he's a he's an alcoholic he's trying to like not be but he's just kind of like he's i believe he's a like a sheriff or a deputy or something in this town but his life's just kind of in shambles and you learn that his it it kind of stems from the relationship we had with his father james coburn's character who is just the meanest son of a bitch he's like a drunk beat his mom just like he's just like the nastiest man and this just kind of infected nick nolte's character who is trying to like live his life he has a girlfriend played by stacy spacek his brother is played by willem dafoe he's not in the movie that much but whenever he's there i love him because i love willem dafoe um but he just kind of he's dealing with all this family stuff a tragedy happens that i won't get into but at the same time um there is like a a man who goes on a hunting trip with another man and uh the one of the guys ends up dead and it is ruled an accident but nick nolte thinks that maybe it wasn't and due to this other tragedy that happens his mind starts to get a little little foggy and stuff and he starts remembering all these times from his childhood of just like his dad his dad being abusive and it just kind of all swirls together as his life his life is falling apart and it's just kind of devolves from there and it's kind of has some noirish tendencies where you're like there's mysterious meetings and like confrontations and like you're not really sure what to think of certain characters and it's just the way it plays with moral amb ambiguity is really interesting but both nick nolte and james james coburn were nominated uh coburn's the only one that won but nick nolte puts on a hell of a performance um it's just the movie i think could have been a little bit shorter uh, there are times where i don't know i kind of found myself getting a little bit um uh, checked out of the narrative a little bit it, it kind of has two different styles which i'll talk about a little bit more and when i'm talking about the video side of things but whenever he's having these flashbacks to his childhood it's uh it gets really it, it kind of shifts um cameras i i'm not sure i'm guessing it was either a 16 millimeter or maybe even eight millimeter it's a very grimy video uh, like whenever it's flashback to this time um but it, it kind of does that a look like a few too many times and some of the kind of extraneous plot lines you kind of get a, a little bit they could have been streamlined a little bit but the emotional impact is there so with like this character dealing with his dad who's still just as ornery as as always and just like he's always trying to teach him how to like be a man even into adulthood and just kind of that toxicity um it's very effective it's unset it's upsetting but it's very effective and uh the way it all kind of ties together it's very interesting even though it didn't quite meet my lofty expectations it's still a very good movie i just i don't know i expected just a little bit more maybe i'll get more of that upon a rewatch i just didn't quite hit what i wanted it but still very good there's not much to this blu-ray it's just they gave us this blu-ray and like a theatrical trailer and a 2k scan from the 35 millimeter uh, original film elements um and it looks okay it doesn't look great but like i said some of the flashbacks are supposed to be uh intentionally gritty and grimy and stuff but even like the more modern footage it looks good but it's still a very gritty image i think maybe even a little bit more so than it's supposed to be but it looks there's some detail there and it's a very it's a wintry palette so it's like a lot of like dead vegetation and snow and stuff throughout um so it's not like a colorful film but it's just like a very dour depressing film so it's not visually rich but it looks nice on high definition but not like amazing and i'm glad to have it on blu-ray it just does it's not set your expectations accordingly it's not gonna like blow you away it's just not a very visually beautiful movie um even though there's some beautiful shots um other than that that's what you're getting you're getting a pretty like a pretty solid paul schrader movie on high definition and that's pretty much it um so if you've been wanting it like i have it's here it looks it's passable it looks good uh, it's just not amazing so i'm glad to have it with some caveats <laughs> hmm. i'm really surprised that i haven't heard of that one either um especially mm -hmm. with being a paul schrader film and the mm -hmm. cast um but uh yeah sounds like for me maybe a try before you buy but it's like you said it's for completists that's so good to have um mm -hmm. 
Speaking of completists, um, I am a big Lucio Fulci fan, so I was really happy because just like Kathy's Curse, I did not own this on Blu-ray when they put it out, um, but it's on 4K now, and that is um, The Devil's Honey um, from Severin. And this one does have a slip cover, and Ooh. very spicy. Yep, <laughs> um, bunch of extras, and again, I believe these are all port overs from the Blu-ray. Um, no booklet, but here's the inside. Okay, so uh, this was really a really interesting one because I had not seen this one either. Um. And I've like owned slash seen most of Falchi's stuff. So this was like late 80s. So this kind of came after um, his sort of highest highs with his zombie movies, um, with his like gory movies, um, like New York Ripper. And it's not quite where he's going downhill, but it's it's a little bit of a mixed bag. But I will say um, it's very risque without really being like hardcore like so this is what i always like about fulci he will always with with one or two exceptions he will always show me something that i've never seen before so in this case this is about a woman who's dating this um saxophone player and they're like deeply in love they have this scene where they're supposed to be recording uh some music and they're alone she is like, I'm trying to think of a nice way to say it. She is straddling his saxophone and he's playing it and sort of getting her, her you excited. Know. Yes. <laughs> that's like really weird and different but the way they film it it is kind of kind of hot um <laughs> but it's it's funny because i mentioned new york new york ripper because that one had a um toe banging scene which is another uh first for me that uh probably everybody else um so um yeah this is Basically, this is a revenge film, but it's like like spiced up quite a bit. Um, the long and the short of it is this doctor is kind of having these affairs. Um, his wife catches him and she's like, I want to force. Um, I'm going to take you for everything that you're worth. Meanwhile, after he's sort of hit with that news, he has to operate on um, said saxophone player. Um, who had like a motorcycle accident he's so um, shook from this like confrontation with his wife that uh, he messes up in the operation and he died the guy dies mm -hmm. and the saxophone player's girlfriend kidnaps the doctor and sort of like tortures him they end up sort of having this twisted love affair um, between the doctor and this this woman and Meanwhile, she's sort of being haunted by like her boyfriend who's it's really in, it's in her head, but she like sees him and he's like talking to her and stuff. But then we get these flashbacks of like this guy was a toxic, abusive piece of shit. Like it's it's flips it on the its head because it wasn't this like grand romance. It was like this guy was really the fucking worst. So I don't want to spoil the ending, but the ending is pretty wild i have to say this isn't like one of my favorite Fulci films i will say like it's interesting the setup is really fascinating i just don't think they ever do enough with that to make it really worthwhile it's not a long movie like the pacing is fairly uh well like Fulci never really 
drew things out if he didn't have to, which is um, which I like. But you know, if you like Fulci's like Giallo's and you like his like horror films, even some of his like um, fantasy films, like this one just never really like gets to those highs um, of like his other movies. Um, but if you're a completist like I am, uh, it was a wild ride. I liked it. I didn't love it. it. It is weird. It is like crazy enough to sort of justify um, checking it out. And as I said, we do get a really nice array of features um, that it's not just a trailer. It's just like a whole slew of really nice interviews. It's just, it's fine. I I think that it's, I would say like if you're a diehard erotic thriller fan, check it out. If you're a diehard Lucio Fulci film, uh, fanatic like I am, check it out. Really solid release though. This looks really good. Unlike unlike Kathy's Curse, this one is a little bit more visually interesting. So I was happy to kind of have that really nice, crisp 4K uh, presentation. Um, sounds really good as well. And you can order it uh, with a slipcover um, from Severin. And um, again, like we always say, these are like limited. So if you want the slipcover, you want to get on that sooner rather than later. But yeah, I'm really happy to have another Fulci film in my collection. I, I guess it's kind of a soft recommendation for, for me. It's just, if the plot synopsis sounds like something you would dig, then you should probably just, you know, blind buy it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm still early in my Fulci journey. So uh, I don't know if, if spicy is the road to go down, but maybe I'll try it. I guess we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Um, my I'm doing uh, two titles from Arrow video that I'm excited to dig into. Um, the first of which um, is uh, the Ten Star uh, from Anthony Mann. Uh, you were just talking about a Western earlier. Uh, I'm doing one of the other iconic uh, Western directors, Anthony Mann. Um, here is the reversible cover art. I went ahead and reversed it here, but uh, the 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 standard version uh, matches the slip cover. Um, you get, uh, here's the inside of the disc and you get plenty of little swag. You get um, these uh, art cards here. So um, you get like, here's like this and then it's on the back. Each one looks like uh, this. So you get uh, that, that, here, 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 and here. So you got six of those and a fold out poster, which has both of the uh, artworks I, I showed you. This one seems a little smaller than most of the ones we get from Arrow, but uh, here it is. <laughs> uh, so you got here and here and then you got a booklet with some essays and stuff so you here's the booklet and got some nice uh, press stuff and essays and all kinds of stuff within here um, and then you have the movie itself, which is good. Um, it stars uh, uh, Henry Fonda and Anthony Perkins. And one of his early roles, I think he was only like four or five roles into his career whenever he got this. Um, uh, Henry Fonda, he uh, plays a bounty hunter who, uh, bounty hunter that you um, learn used to be a, a sheriff who has come to town to claim like the his most recent bounty, which was like a, a wanted dead or alive type bounty. He brought him in dead, which kind of shakes the community that he's bringing it into a little bit. Um, and uh, Anthony Perkins plays the interim sheriff and he's kind of like, he's a young kid who's not really sure what he's doing with himself. Um, and he's kind of thrust into the situation um, that his, uh, potential love interest doesn't really want him to be in and he doesn't he but he kind of like feels responsible for the town and he ends up forming this friendship with the henry fonda character and learning from him 
how to be a proper sheriff and how not to escalate certain situations and how to like have confidence and like just kind of went just kind of how to be a sheriff really um who from someone who used to be a sheriff but no longer wants to be because he's kind of saddled with some like guilt and all this stuff um it's kind of your standard Western trope. Like if you've seen a Western, they kind of cycle through different kind of storylines with little like slight variations here and there, but it's usually just how it's executed. And this is executed very well. And you have great performers like Henry Fonda, who's like amazing in this one. And you have like a small town conflict where there's like, of course, like a ruffian who's creating all kinds of like uh, mayhem in the town, but everyone's afraid of him. So of course, Anthony Perkins has to come into his own in order to stand up to him and save the town. And it's all your standard stuff. It works very well. If you love like classic Westerns, this is a classic Western and this uh, is just a really, it's a really uh, spry tale too. It's only a little over 90 minutes long. Um, it's 93 minutes long. So it like, it really zips by, but it, like it has good character moments, good action, beautiful cinematography. It's pretty much everything you want out of a classic Western and it's Anthony Mann. So, you know, his stuff's impeccable. Um, and this release is really solid. It comes from a HD master prepared by Paramount. Um, I didn't see any egregious signs of like digital smoothing or anything, even if it was handled by Paramount. Um, look, it's not quite to the level of certain like uh, restorations like um, uh, Humphrey Bogart's The Desperate Hours, which I talked about several months ago, which got like a 6K scan. I'm not sure the actual scan of this one, but it looks nice. Uh, there's some minor things here and there that maybe could have been further cleaned up, but overall it's a really nice transfer and uh, it's a pretty decent um, special features. Um, you get um, three different audio options. So you get the original mono, a 2.0 stereo, and then a 5.1 surround sound. You do get a commentary track from a film historian, a 28 minute uh, appreciation piece, and then a 32 minute uh, interview with the son of Elmer Bernstein who did the score. So you get to get uh, a lot of great uh, information about his dad and stuff. And it's a really cool uh, interview. So um, the 10 stars are a really good one from Arrow Video if you like Westerns. And then another from Arrow Video that I have is uh, the Scarface Mob, uh, which is one that wasn't really on my radar, um, but I think for a good reason, once you hear kind of the background of it, this is, uh, this is the um, reversible cover art that I did for it. Alrighty, um, this was originally basically the pilot of the TV show, The Untouchables. Uh, and then this is the same kind of Elliot Ness story that inspired the Kevin Costner movie and other kind of Al Capone tales based on the original book. Um, but uh, uh, so this was originally kind of like a two-part pilot that was kind of reconfigured into this. See, I knew that other poster was smaller. This is a lot bigger. <laughs> uh, reconfigured into like an actual movie. Um, and uh, so I, I haven't been able to track down the, or the Untouchable series yet um, to see if it is just a direct port of the original two-part pilot um, and just reconfigured exactly. But um, you do um, get uh, uh, this, that, that series has yet to be released in HD um, yet. So even if you, if it was the ex exact same, which it isn't, um, you uh, wouldn't have it in HD yet like you do now. Um, so those are the six art cards. I showed you the poster and then you also have uh, this booklet. So um, just essays and a lot of good information in here about his kind of legacy. Um, but yeah, the, the narrative itself is like I mentioned, kind of the, the Elliot Ness story that was like, kind of dramatized like for dramatic effect but it, overall it's like the the spirit of the story is kind of kept intact of just like this this team that is brought together to kind of try to take down Al Capone and um but it's it's during a time where, like it's not as violent as the Brian De Palma version uh but it it has a real charm to it that I really enjoy and there's like a there are some moments that I think like oh 
if this isn't the exact same as the TV version, which I don't think it is, I, I can see where it's different because there's a little bit some racy stuff that I wasn't expecting even. What, I think this what, what, uh, it should have been during the Hayes Code, but there are some kind of things I was like, oh, they're getting away with some stuff. So, um, But it's a really nice kind of, kind of procedural-esque tale, just like these agents trying to take down Al Capone. It's a, it's a solid movie um and it's it works as a movie but it does also make me hope that paramount um gets the untouchables remastered and put on blu-ray because they've been doing a lot of like old things like andy griffith andy griffith and gomer Pyle and stuff like that so if they can do the untouchables i'm going to be very happy um so this also comes from an hd master prepared by paramount this is one of the it, it looks good but it is an example of I wish Arrow could have gotten their hands on this and done a little bit more work because it is one of the releases that I think have fared the weakest from Arrow in recent memory because you do actually see some of the damage that remains like some there are some vertical lines in certain stretches that like are remain from some of the print damage and I'm like oh I don't usually expect that from an Arrow a modern Arrow release so that was a little um surprising and there's also some like audio variations here where you'll get a little bit of like certain words are muffled at points and like a little bit of like just up and down variants and so it's still good but there's just some issues with like the source that i was not expecting and i don't usually like uh, think of when i think of arrow but it's still a nice release but there's the audio and visual is not as good as i thought it would be but it's still good um, and, and in terms of uh, special features, they get a 23-minute um, uh, visual essay and then a 19-minute appreciation piece. Um, that That's pretty much everything um, in terms of like special features. Neither of these were like loaded to the gills or special features, but it's still a good release. So if you're interested, if you like the Untouchable show or you like the Al Capone story, the Scarface mobs are a really solid movie. And it's they're good releases from Arrow Video, even if I wish they could just completely take over the remastering from Paramount and not just have to be releasing what they're given. Yeah. Um, again, it's kind of wild because, like, I like, you know, those filmmakers, but, like, I've never heard of either of those uh, mm -hmm. titles. And I'm a huge Anthony Mann fan, so, <laughs> like, um, really enjoy his westerns. Um, Arrow also did a really good one. Um, the Far Country, um, if you hmm. are so inclined and want to check that out as well. So my uh, next title is another Severin uh, one. And again, another one that I was really close to just buying, but um, I'm glad that I waited because we have a 4K of it now. And that is Butcher, hmm. Baker, Nightmare Maker. And uh, this is a slipcover. Uh, here's the back. Uh, I like this cover better than this one. Mm -hmm. um i've seen online some people complaining about uh this one which i i, I get it because um it's not the most visually interesting like this one um and then we have another um this is the um i think it was the night walker or there was some alternative title night warning that's right i, was, I think there was another movie mm -hmm. called that but anyways um tons of features Oh boy. So uh it's like tricky talking about this movie, right? Because I will say from the jump that it's it's baked into the plot that there is a very bigoted um sheriff and this actually is sort of a LGBT uh Q um horror film, or at least it's queer coded. Um mm -hmm. And you have a sheriff that is very bigoted. I we're definitely not supposed to like him, but I'm just throwing it out there. There's a lot of um, slurs, uh, which I'm going to say, but you can use your imagination. Um, so if that uh, bothers you, you might want to like skip this one because, again, I don't ever think that it's supposed to be the the film's point of view. It's just kind of baked into the plot. So. Um, do with that what you will but if you're still interested this is such a crazy like 
sleazy, nasty little indie film. Susan Tyrell plays one of the most icky like characters, maybe of all time. Um, she, I, I don't even think that it's like, it's more than just suggested that she wants her uh, nephew. Like she, it's like, she's very into him. <laughs> it's really gross. She is like literally obsessed with him to the point where she's sabotaging his life. Um, And I don't want to divulge any more because there is some like really interesting twists, but this movie opens with um maybe one of the coolest car crashes. It almost feels like Final Destination 2 maybe, maybe borrowed something from this because there is a log truck and the log truck just goes right through the, the window and like you can kind of guess where that goes and uh it's not gratuitous though it sets up you know what happened to the parents but i mean we could have just had them die off screen but we didn't because the filmmakers love us and mm -hmm. they want us to see all this crazy shit um bill um Hallman? plays the bully in this. I, I get him and Bill Paxton. Uh, um, Bill Paxton. Um, <laughs> the president. Um, so yeah, he uh, he's in it. He plays uh, a bully in this. I don't, know if, I don't know if I want to say it's a great movie, but it definitely is such a boundary pushing, icky, gross exploitation film. And it's a heck of a lot of mm -hmm. fun. If you have Shudder, um, they do have the um, Joe Bob uh, Briggs did an episode um, for this on the la last drive in. Um, so if you kind of want to have a fun try before you buy and you have shutter, um, that's a fun way to watch it as well. But I am so excited because I want it really wanted to own this. And for a while, it was actually kind of like low key out of print and hard to find before like Severin started like re-releasing it. I think like this maybe had a code red release before this. Um, and those always go out of print pretty quickly and are expensive. So if you waited patiently, like you're going to be rewarded or if you're upgrading, I think this is worth upgrading. Um, and yeah, so um, we get a ton of special features. We get um, three commentary tracks, which is awesome. And then we get a slew of um, cast and crew interviews to round out the second Blu-ray disc, uh, as well as a TV spot. Looks really good. Kind of like Kathy's Curse. It's not really like a spectacularly beautiful looking movie, but I am so glad that like we have a really nice, crisp, clean looking 4K presentation here. There is a little bit of like roughness, but it's nothing that I found personally distracting and um, yeah, sounds really good as well. No complaints with the audio. Um, actually, I was pretty impressed with like some of the more dynamic scenes, like how much range the audio had in this release. So I don't know. I love this movie. It's so weird. I, I love it despite it having some very uncomfortable moments, but like, it sounds weird, but I mean, for me, it's sort of part of its charm because it, it, it is a movie that's supposed to make you feel uncomfortable. And they do talk about things like incest that are like very icky and stuff. But I don't know. It's 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 very boundary pushing. I mean, I think like if you like transgressive cinema, you should definitely check this out um, again. I don't know if I love this side of the slipcover. I like this more, but. I guess you can just swap it around if you want. But yeah, it's a really fantastic release. Um, I am so happy that Severin put this out in 4K. And if you haven't seen it, buy it or watch the Joe Bob Briggs episode and then buy it. But just buy it because it's so damn good. <laughs> yeah, that's one I remember. It, it stuck out to me whenever it was released a few years ago just because of the title. I was like, that's a fun title. And I... I knew it was in the Kino family somewhere because I just remember seeing it around, but I never got around to it. So now that I have your endorsement, uh, I guess I'll have to check it out. And so I have, uh, so I'm very intrigued by that opening car crash because I love Final Destination too. It's one of my favorites of the franchise. So I'm definitely going to have to check that one out for sure. Uh, my next couple of titles are multi-film titles, but it, it, it'll go faster than my last two titles because um, this is just one 
set. Um, this is from Metrograph Pictures. Uh, this is uh, The Little Girl Who Sold the Sun and Le Fonc. Um, this, I was really interested in this. Um, these are two films from, forget my pronunciation. Um, this is from Jabril Diop Mambetti, uh, who is a Senegalese filmmaker, um, who I have not really had the chance to watch any of his stuff yet, but I am interested in Senegalese cinema. I like, uh, uh, Simbin, uh, who he is getting a new criterion set next month. I believe it's like a four or five film set that I'm really excited about. Cause I really liked his film Mandabi. So I was interesting with it for a, to do a Senegalese filmmaker that kind of grew out of his legacy because this was a more uh not a young like a much younger director but he kind of came in the intervening years and he uh, eventually died I believe in the late 90s or early 2000s right after like pretty much these were his last few films which these are technically I would say short films they each run about 40-ish minutes long uh but um th they're very good for what they're doing he intended it as a trilogy of uh, films he only got two of them created before he passed away of uh, just like um everyday people trilogy and just kind of like simple stories of like s everyday citizens and uh in africa and um the i really like both of these the, the little girl who sold the sun which is kind of where this main picture comes from um it's about it's literally what it says but uh you have to take it into its context it is about a little girl who um it, she has a disability she like walks around with like these like crutches um and but she wants to kind of provide for her family and um she decides to start selling the sun newspaper uh for the uh the, lo the local merchant and stuff so she's going around trying to sell this newspaper and make money and she it's kind of like showing her her journey around town and like who she runs into some for some opposition she like uh gets into from like some people who are also trying to sell newspapers and stuff and it's just a really it's uh charming um it's a little bit uh harrowing at times but it's uh it's a really good story and i really liked it quite a bit la franc uh it's kind of like a not an overt comedy but more of like um like an existential comedy it's about like a man who he's also kind of down on his luck he um he has like a kind of a like a nagging landlord who's always trying to like get him to pay but he doesn't have any money and but he's like spending his money on like different things including lottery tickets and he ends up getting a winning lottery ticket one day but what he does with his lottery tickets is he like glues it to his like bedroom his like bedroom door so he doesn't lose it and he gets like stuck on the door so he has to like transport his door across the city to like redeem this lottery ticket and it's just kind of like his journey across the city it's like these are both very simple tales but it's a really funny premise of just like him kind of getting himself in this, this situation and you're like what's he gonna do how's he gonna get out of this and just it's just kind of like karmically funny and i i look i like both of these quite a bit they're both very enjoyable and like compared to some like international cinema that i watch it can be very depressing whenever it's addressing societal issues this kind of takes more of a lighter touch where it's just like more kind of like like i said karmically funny or satirical um i like both of these and they've been restored very well um these both been given 2k restorations um and um they look very nice they have both have 5.1 soundtracks in the original languages each film gets a commentary track uh from the same film historian who gets a lot of great context and then there's an additional 28 minute uh documentary that, that kind of tells about the director and stuff um so you get a some good context from both commentaries. You get a little bit about the director and each film looks and sounds really good. So this is a top tier release. Each film together, they it's a, it's equivalent to watching like an hour and a half film. So um, this is a really nice release. Um, so if it sounds good to you. If you're interested in international cinema or Senegalese cinema, the this uh, the little girl who sold the sun and La Franc uh, from Jabril Diop Membeti uh, is a good pickup. <laughs> Good job. I would not have probably said that any better. <laughs> so um, weigh in in the comments uh, if you speak French and let me know. <laughs> Did you do well? Um, probably. Sounds right.
<laughs> um, so this is my not final title, but my final mm -hmm. Severin title. This was so awesome because all four of these Severin titles is like stuff that I've had on my like wish list for a while, but now you know, uh, they've all been upgraded to 4K. So my final title is The Great Alligator. Um, this is a Sergio Martino uh film, and I really like his movies. Um if you haven't like seen any of his giallos, they're some of the best, along with him and Falchi. Mm -hmm. Uh so they got some different artwork. Uh here's the back. Really again, nice uh, array of features. Pop this bad boy open. There's the discs. Um yeah, so this is basically a Jaws ripoff. Um and it also is just another trigger warning. They're um they're natives in this movie. And uh it's not portrayed uh, particularly great, as you can imagine. So um, just throwing that out there. Um, but um, this movie's not bad. It, again, it's not, it's kind of like the, um, the Devil's Honey. Um, this isn't one of my favorites from this director. I think there's, there's much better work. Um, it is fun. It is one of those um, nature run amok movies. The plot is very straightforward but somehow still overly convoluted i don't know it makes for a little bit of a muddled experience but the acting is decent the like kills and blood and stuff isn't maybe like as crazy as some of his other films but uh it's enjoyable narrative wise it's never as like straightforward and efficient and coherent as like i think it could have been also um it, nothing is nothing that cool really happens unfortunately dang um <laughs> but uh yeah i don't know it's fun um the alligator um like effects are actually not really that bad um i was actually really surprised how they were able to sort of match real um gators with like fake the fake ones but um mm -hmm. yeah it's um it's fine. Again, if you're a completist, you like Sergio Martino like I do, um, you're going to want to have this in your collection. And uh, we do have like an uh, interview from the director, and we have a series of, of interviews from like the cast and the crew. We have a really nice, I think this is like maybe one of my favorite features on this disc, a video essay by uh, Lee, uh, Lee Gambin, who is the author of Massacred by mother nature that is such a really interesting um video essay and it kind of throws in a couple um production drawings which i think is interesting i wanted to point that out as something like not just interviews or commentary tracks or anything like that's a nice little addition um this one is just um region a i also wanted to throw that out there to backtrack this one is region a b and c um, so any of you importing stuff, that's some good information for y'all. But this one's just region lock A. This one, uh, I will say, might be one of my favorite as far as like transfer goes. Um, all the outdoor scenes look absolutely gorgeous in this 4K restoration. Like I was really impressed. There's a little bit of distortion. There's a little bit of you can tell the the footage isn't wasn't maybe taken the best care of, but. I have to say, I again, really impressed. Like, they really did a nice job of, like, cleaning this up and restoring it. So this is one that I have seen on DVD before, and this is a, a major step up. I believe that this also had a Blu-ray release, but, yeah, 4K, uh, get it. It's awesome. If you're not 4K capable yet, um, there is a Blu-ray uh, copy as well. Nice. Uh, excellent uh, presentation movie is just quite kind of okay but if you love sort of nature run amok you like sergio martino i think there's much better films of of uh from him but yeah if you're a completist uh this is a really nice addition yeah i do like sergio martino quite a bit from the giallo that i've seen from him so i am very interested in picking that one up i'll keep my expectations in check i really liked the uh the screen factor release of alligator I'm, I'm not going to expect it to be on that level, but I, I do love alligator movies, so I'm excited to check it out. My next title, uh, 
it's one that I'm very excited to speak about. Um, this is uh, in, in so from Carlotta Films in association with Kino Lorber. Um, this is Jean Moreau filmmaker, uh, which is uh, Jean Moreau is an like an iconic French actress who did get into directing for a very short while. And she did three films and all three films are in this collection. It's a two disc collection. Um, so you get um, uh, Lumiere and the Adolescent on disc one and then Lillian Gish on disc two, which I, I kind of wish that they had like maybe put one of these films with Lillian Gish because that's only an hour long and these are both a little over an hour and a half. And I think space wise it would have worked better, but it still looks good. I didn't notice much in the way of compression issues. It just, it, it bothered me. I was like, why do you put these two definitely feature length movies and then just leave this one hour long thing with like not a ton of special features on that disc. I digress. Um, but these, uh, these films, these are quite good. I enjoyed them um, quite a bit. So the first one, Lumiere, um, it has Jean Moreau starring in it along with some of her uh, some other actresses, um, some of which she's worked with in the past and some new acquaintances. Um, but this kind of ta really takes her um, history in film and kind of translates it to the screen because it, it's one of those films that I really like. It's almost kind of like a hangout film, but not in a derogatory way where it's just like um, a bunch of like French women, which Jean, uh, she plays an actress who are just kind of like, at the beginning, you see them just like chatting around a table about some of their, their lives and exploits and stuff. But then they kind of all kind of like splinter off a little bit and you see some like, uh, like Jean's character, um, like on, working on a film set. And she's kind of has like a couple different things going with different men who are like, uh, like infatuated with her or trying to have a relationship with her. And then like some of the other women in their lives, you see them doing their own thing, getting like living their own lives. And like you kind of interweave throughout. And I really like that uh, it's giving uh, a large focus to women and like not, not strict, like some of them have relationship stuff going on, but others have substantial issues going on. And it's just like a female driven tale behind the camera telling a story about women. And I, I like that she break, got to bring that perspective and kind of tell the story that she kind of always wanted to tell. And it's a really good movie and I liked it quite a bit. Um, there's also um, some notable names in there. Um, I believe it's Keith Carradine is in there. One of the Carradines is in there in a small role. And then Bruno Gans, um, who played uh, Hitler in Downfall along with other things. I've talked about him in the past. He's uh, He makes an appearance. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty solid movie. The Adolescent, the second movie, the second narrative movie um is uh also very much my type of type of movie it's uh set in like the late 1930s during world war ii uh, it's a young girl going with her family to the country uh, i believe it's in france they're going to go into a country village and she's 13 years old and she's kind of right at that kind of coming of age type age where she's like everyone in town is kind of like on their own kind of little freak shit like they're like all kind of like sexually free and liberated and you could like oh yeah the butcher is like having an affair with this woman and this person's doing this thing and like this person's lusting over this person it's just like this young girl kind of noticing all these things even her own parents she like kind of like notices are just like boning down all summer and but like there's a lot of stuff like she develops her own crushes and then she's like there's like potentially like her mom might be having an affair and but it's all set like also there's like an undercurrent of like world war ii is knocking on the door and like to actually coming into their town and so there's like a little bit of like uh, anti-semitism mixed in here as well with some in some of the village and it's a really interesting blend of just like uh, a period piece but with like a coming of age slant and but it's not like soft peddling any of the issues that young girls face but it's not like gross uh, because like it is being told by a woman so i really like that it's a really interesting movie i quite liked um the final film is lillian gish which is a documentary that she made on the silent film star lillian gish um uh, in the 80s and i like like the, she is a, already an elderly woman by this time because she was there basically at the dawn of hollywood Jean gets her to tell all these like super interesting stories about the early days of Hollywood and silent filmmaking 
and she's seen and heard a lot of different things and it's super fascinating throughout and it's only an hour long i wish it was longer because like she has so many great stories and i'm glad like i don't think a lot of silent film stars really got to just unburden themselves of all their knowledge that like and i, I think it's very special that someone thought like hey we should make a documentary on this woman who was there and i think it's it's a really cool documentary um and a very rewarding and um so that's really cool and you get special features throughout a couple of different featurettes per movie um you get something really cool um on the on the lillian gish disc on the second disc you get a 22 minute interview from the early 90s of jean moreau talking to clint eastwood at the Cannes film festival about his career it's pretty fun i like that a lot um, and then there's also some other kind of like interview st featurettes. Um, the Lumiere and the Adolescent have each been given a 4K restoration from the original uh, negatives, and they both look very nice. Um, the Lillian Gish documentary, the 16 millimeter footage no longer exists, apparently, according to the verbiage. So they use the best surviving elements of that. It doesn't look perfect, but it looks very nice and stuff overall. And yeah, it's just three really great movies from a filmmaker who... I wish you had been able to do more than three films because they were all really good. But as an actor, she's amazing. As a filmmaker, she's very good. So Jean Moreau filmmaker is definitely worth checking out. If you like French cinema in any form or just like, like supporting like women directors, she's, I'm really glad that this got put on Blu-ray. It's a really good set. Nice. Well, I like all of those things. So, nice. <laughs> And that is such a weird transition into my um, <laughs> final film, um, which is another uh, really exciting uh, 4K upgrade. This has been out. Um, this movie has been out there in the, in the ether for a while now. Um, this is by far the best it's ever looked. And that is Night of the Blood Monster, a.k.a. The Bloody Judd. Mm -hmm. And I think the latter title is what I most remember it from because I, I'm trying to think the label that put this out as like a box set with other Christopher Lee movies, but I digress. Um, so here is the back. Uh, again, really nice amount of features. Um, three commentary tracks. Uh, mm -hmm. Pretty great. Um, and um, yeah, like interviews, some nice featurettes, but we'll take a look at the inside. Um, there are the discs, and I was trying to see if this, I believe this is also the, um, yes, so this is the um, uncut 103 minute version of the film, if you guys are wondering, um, I think there's maybe just like a, an additional scene or two of violence, um, and you know, just Franco, I'm a, you know, long time viewers will know I'm a little hot and cold. Uh, on his films, his filmography. Um, I think that his movies have really good potential, but he's always kind of, kind of more focused on the like TNA and maybe not really like a story, like just basic things. <laughs> um, and that sounds shitty. And I like, I mean, listen, I know there's people that are just huge um, devotees of, of him and that's great. I will say... I really like this film. I think that he was working with a, a bit of a, actually looks like a decent budget. It's not huge, but the scope and scale of it's really nice. It actually kind of reminded me uh, of a really great Hammer film, like that sort of level of like production design. And, you know, that seems fitting because, you know, he got, of course, like a star, Christopher Lee, as the titular judge. And Christopher Lee just eats up this role devours it it kind of reminded me of um when vincent price played the Witchfinder general um which is another excellent movie but it, it does have definitely you know um just franco's kind of usual kinky like whipping nudity um it's it's like hilariously gratuitous but I mean, I wouldn't expect it, it to be a movie from him and not have something like that. But yeah, this actually has a really decent story there. It feels like there's characters that I can really kind of like, maybe, not, maybe they're not 
fully drawn out where I can super connect with them, but it, I certainly more than like most of his films, like there's clear motivations for people. Um, there's like a couple like pretty good, like needle uh, rips at certain points. Um, and I don't want to spoil it, but the ending is crazy. Uh, it's very satisfying. Um, I was really like very happy with, with, just all of this. Um, so um, both discs um, have, as I showed you, um, if you're not four way, uh, four way. Wow, sorry. <laughs> if you're not four K capable, um, it does have a Blu-ray. Um, bl the Blu-ray also has um, the commentary tracks as well as the other like um, special features, and then the four K disc does have all three of the um, commentary tracks. I have to say Blue Underground like crushed it with this um, 4K presentation. Like I said, is this it felt like a really well executed Hammer film, which they were always really known for like their beautiful like exterior shots. And like some of the sets are very great and gross and grimy. And like this 4K presentation really like enhances that. And uh, sounds really great as well. I was kind of, um, it's kind of a bummer this didn't have like a soundtrack or something with it. But I'm just, I'm really, I, I'm really excited to have this in my collection. Again, if you're a Just Franco fan, if you're a Christopher Lee fan, you or you just kind of like, kind of like with me, I trust anything Blue Underground puts out. So if you're also in that camp, like check it out. But yeah, I have to say I was fine eating my words. I really like this, this movie. Um, is it a masterpiece? No. Was I thoroughly entertained? Yes. So, and again, this is a really good presentation. Just the whole package. Really great. Great job. I love Blue Underground, but I, even they weren't enough to make me say yes to <laughs> watching the Jess Franco film. Uh, I also love Christopher Lee, so I, I'm i probably missing out, but also I, You're I, have, enough. I have enough. <laughs> I'm good at <laughs> But I'm glad it's a good release. I knew it would be with Blue Underground. They never let me down. So I'm glad it's a good one. Uh, my final two titles, I'll try to get through pretty quickly. Um, these are both uh, manufactured on demand Blu-ray. So these are both burned discs. So um, if you have a player that doesn't work well with those, uh, just be forewarned. Um, so this is the first one is from Giant Interactive. Um, it is The Contender. Uh, with Joan Allen, Jeff Bridges, Gary Oldman, Christian Slater, uh, so many people. William Peterson. There's a, there's a lot of people in here. This was nominated for two Academy Awards. So I got, uh, with Affliction and then this, I got some like Academy Award nominees knocked out. Um, this was nominated for uh, Joan Allen and I believe Best Actress and then Jeff Bridges and Best Supporting Actor. Um, neither of them won, but uh, this is a pretty solid film. It's from the director of a film you talked about a few weeks ago, The Last Castle. This was one of the films he did before that. And this kind of has like a similar kind of like tone, like it's like kind of inspirational, but thriller-ish. This involves, at the very beginning of the film, um, a supposed hero is overlooked for a potential VP nomination in favor of Joan Allen's character. And due to the situation of like this presidency, she has to get kind of like congressional approval or Senate approval, one of those. Um, so she has to go basically uh, throughout this like rigorous trial on like in Congress to get approved to be the president's vice president. Cause he's like in need of a vice president for reasons. Uh, so it's basically a tale of like Joan Allen, uh, her character potentially has some skeletons in her closet, but they're not really skeletons. It's more so just like people slut shaming her. And it's kind of like dealing with like whenever recently we've had like um, Supreme Court justices go like have to go through their whole rigmarole. It's kind of like that, but with uh, the vice president role. And so you get a lot of like, people trying to like sabotage certain nominations and like people like running counter investigations and it's all really just like political thriller minded but like also kind of like has an undercurrent of like don't slut shame slash believe women and like all this kind of stuff which 20 years ago it's it's it's, it's kind of doing the work there's some things that it stumbles on but overall it's a pretty 
decent watch with there's a few things that made me cringe but most movies do at least a little bit <laughs> like if you go back more than like a decade <laughs> um but overall it's a pretty good political thriller this was originally released by dreamworks i wish they had released the actual blu-ray like through paramount i don't i'm not sure how giant got them but i i think this this deserves much better than a burn disc um it's just a data transfer it looks very soft and like it, it's hd but like it's not been like remastered in any me meaningful way so if this ever got remastered on blu-ray or just a 4k disc that'd be excellent um but i had been looking to get this and i think the only other blu-ray release in the world was imprint in australia which i didn't want to import it because i didn't get to review it so um I'm, I'm a cheap ass so i have to deal i have to take what i can get uh so if you just want to watch the movie it is on blu-ray but i hope someone nabs it and gives it a remaster at some point because it i think it deserves it's a pretty solid political thriller and then my last actual movie once again a burned disc um is from gravitas ventures and this is in search of the last action heroes um it is a pretty long documentary uh runs about two hours and 20 minutes long and it basically traces the action genre from like the early 80s ish to like early 2000s and just kind of traces like the real birth of just like action cinema as we know it like the main people in it like just like your your van dams and your stallones and Arnold, Arnold Schwarzenegger and like all these uh, people that and like even not as big names but like you have a lot of so many clips so many clips and but also a lot of really good interviews throughout kind of giving context to certain like eras and tr trans like changes throughout the genre over the years and how, what has impacted certain trends like why don't we have certain action like stars anymore and how they've kind of like morphed with american values and stuff it's a it's a really interesting documentary but it's not perfect i think if you're an action junkie or like a film junkie i think you'll enjoy this but as a documentary it's not like completely successful it's very scattershot it's like you don't always get like how does this connect to this? It's just kind of like, here's an idea, here's an idea, here's an idea, here's an idea, here's a fun interview, here's this clip, here's this clip. And like, there's a lot of really cool stuff, but as a cohesive documentary, it's not, it doesn't completely work, but as like kind of like a, almost like a, oh cool, I like that movie and I like that person. Like it works, it's just not like all it can be. Um, and I, I haven't seen a lot of the other like kind of in search of movies. I know there are some, genres or things that are explored i think there's a horror version like that's like four hours long or six hours there's like a really long one that and i think maybe even you and andre spoke about like one of the like maybe the sci-fi one or something a couple years ago so i know that i don't think it's the same director because i looked at the director but it's like kind of in that vein so it's it's very exhaustive and it's still two hours and 20 minutes but i think it could have been better structured like even give more time and like kind of spend more time doing like going deep into certain things or make it a little bit more like like smooth and transition i think it would have like worked a little bit better but there's some really great interviews i really like a lot of the people that they got in here um and it's just it's entertaining it's just not all it can be um there's not much to this it looks really good it sounds good and there's a trailer um once again i wish it had been given more than a burn disc but i'm glad to have it on blu-ray um and it's worth checking out if you love action movies uh you just might might want to complement it with some other documentaries like the go go boys the can the canon documentary or so certain other documentaries like that i should not it's not going to be your ultimate source of action cinema yeah i i so that is one i've heard of and i'm glad to hear your thoughts because i was sort of waffling on checking that out because i definitely do love like 80s and 90s like action films like the cheesier the better um in fact i was thinking about doing like a the og terminator and robocop as a double feature this weekend like like stuff like that okay. i love um and uh yeah like the in search of documentaries they are really awesome um 
Gray and I did talk about the um, sci-fi uh, edition of that one. And um, yeah, like uh, I know like the horror ones run, I think that like they're about four or five hours a piece, uh, <laughs> which is a, kind of awesome. I used to just break them down into hourly kind of things. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I, it sounds like that one might be maybe a try before I buy kind of thing as well. But um, yeah, um, I like how we had like two bona fide mm -hmm. Oscar winners and some <laughs> like really sleazy. Mm -hmm. Um, three Godfathers might have been nominated for something. Um, yeah. but it just doesn't. I don't know. It's like which one of these doesn't belong. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's. Uh, like I said, that's kind of what's fun about this show is like, you know, we have a little bit of, of everything for everybody, everybody's sort of taste. And if you're like me, like your taste is kind of garbage and you like these like really bad movies um, <laughs> in a good way. <laughs> you know, that is our show for this week. And um, as always, if you like this, please uh, give us some love, uh, comment below, uh, likes all that stuff um, sharing and please subscribe to the channel. We do this show weekly and then there's other really great content. There's like a slew of amazing interviews um, on the geek vibes YouTube channel. And you definitely want to check that out. And uh, again, thank you guys for hanging out with us.